Hey everyone, we're back with another interview. This time we're talking to a great friend of mine, Damian Curtis. Damian is an amazing piano player specializing in jazz and Latin music, and he's also a very accomplished producer, making beats for a wide range of rappers such as Immortal Technique, KRS-One, and Tragedy Gaddafi. In this interview, I pick his brain about his experiences working with different studios and different rappers, and he shares a lot of interesting stories that give us a little glimpse into the inner workings of the rap industry. Hope you enjoy. Damien, thanks so much for being here. How are you doing tonight? Good. I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Appreciate you doing this. So I want to focus mostly on the production stuff because you're one of the few people that I know who has a lot of experience in that world. But maybe we can start off with the piano and then segue into the production and the beat making stuff. Yeah, that's great. Cool. Okay. So what were some of your earliest musical experiences and how did you get introduced to the piano? Uh, I was four years old when I was introduced to the piano by my father. Um, my father, when we moved from New London to Hartford, uh, he gave me an opportunity because he didn't have an opportunity uh, for any private lessons or anything. So he wanted to make sure that we were involved in something, you know, and, and happened to be the piano. And then at a certain point, you got into jazz piano as well. So when did that start to happen? Jazz piano came across... Um, when I got to about junior high, sixth, sixth grade, um, we ended up going to this program called the Artist Collective, uh, run by Jackie McLean, uh, a famous saxophone player. Um, and when I got to, when I got there, uh, he introduced me completely to jazz. And from there on, I kind of took off from there. Awesome. So at what point in your musical development did you get interested in making beats? Um, I was always interested. Um, but I never really pursued it until about college. That was like, it was always, it was introduced to me in high school um, by this, uh, this teacher, Mr. Noga. Um, and as time went on, I, I really was more focused on the jazz uh, playing. Um, and then by college, I would say my junior year in college, I, I you know, started to take it seriously and, and really figure I can really do this. So. Uh, so that was in what, the late 90s when you were in high school? Yes. Yep. Yep. I was okay. in high school. I graduated in 97. Yep. So what were the programs like back then that people were making beats on? Um, a lot of the programs, you still had the MPC. Uh, we were using the MPC at that time and different types of keyboards. Um, the ASR-10 was another one. I remember having that there. Um, so there was a couple, a couple of good keyboards at that time still you know 90 i would say uh you know early 90s late 90s there were there was some good equipment then you know but the, the key thing was really the a lot of the mpcs i remember seeing a lot of the mpc 2000 xls hmm, interesting yeah. um so then you said you got into it a lot more seriously when you were a junior in college yep that's when i really figured i can do it you know it was like one of those things where i was like uh oh i think uh i think this is something like you know it, I've, it was always been in me, but this was like where it was like, you know what? Like, I love it so much. I don't understand why I just don't, you know, pursue it. You know? That's awesome. So did you have any specific producers that you were really into that you were getting some of your inspiration from early on? Yeah. Um, one of my biggest producers was definitely Dr. Dre. I was, I was really influenced by Dr. Dre. Um, Rizzo was another one. Um, I also was influenced by Devante from Jodeci. Um, that was another, to me, a phenomenal producer. Um, uh, and then as time went on, Timberland, you know, Timberland started becoming a little more influential. And uh, I've always listened to a lot of Jay Dilla um, and his stuff dealing with Tricol Quest and, and all that kind of stuff that he did. Awesome. So um, you start making beats your junior year of college. And then eventually at a certain point, you start working with a lot of these big name rappers like Immortal Technique and Tragedy Gaddafi. Uh, KRS one. So, what was at what point did that stuff start happening, and what was the process to get yourself to that point? Well, I was it was it, it was really interesting. Um, I kind of fell into it. I was always producing, and um, I met up with uh, with this rapper. He he, he just walked in. I, I I work at a music store, uh, Martocchio Music, in Sinsbury, Connecticut, and uh, I was just there doing. Uh, the regular retail stuff for the, the in the eventually this you know a guy walks in and um they're looking for equipment 
and stuff like that. And I said, listen, this is not like the store for that kind of stuff. You know, we have guitars and keyboards, but nothing like on high level, you know. And the guy kept looking at me and he goes, do you know who I am? And I said, no, I don't really know you. You know, I don't think I do. And he goes, yeah, you definitely do. And I go, no, I don't know. And he gave me a course to look and it ended up being Cuban Link from uh, mm-hmm. Terror Squad who worked with Big oh, wow. Pun and Fat Joe. Um, so he was like, you know, so I got to meet him then and he said, you know what, I'm actually working on an album, you know, love to have you come by. And I was giving his, I was giving piano lessons, uh, private piano lessons to his manager um, at that time. So that's kind of how it linked up. And he heard some of my stuff and he says, you know what, definitely come by and uh, let's see what we can do. And that's kind of how it started. And then from that point on, was it kind of just word of mouth from there? Yeah, it was mostly word of mouth. I would go to some of the concerts, meet some of the guys, like, for instance, in Mortal Technique. Uh, I met him at this place called Black August, and uh, it's a concert that they give every year in New York. And I went out there. At that time, it was Talib Kweli was performing uh, with Most Deaf. Common was there. Uh, so it was a pretty pretty big concert, and Immortal Technique wasn't performing, but he was actually selling his CDs on the steps. And uh, I had his sets, I had a CD already, so I knew who it was. But uh, I ended up buying another one and just sitting down and politicking and talking to him. And um, we got to talk about a lot of different stuff. And then he was like, yeah, just send, send me some beats. And uh, I said, oh, sure, I'll, I'll send you some beats. He gave me his, uh, his email on, on one of his uh, CDs. And uh, I never sent it to him. It took me about another year before I ran into him again at Toad's place in, in New Haven, Connecticut. And when I did run into him again, he had asked again for the beats. So I was like, wow. oh, I probably should send it to him and see what happens, you know? So I finally sent him the beats. And uh, six months later, he finally gives me a call. He uh, tells me, you know, he wants to do something with one of the beats. That's wild. So he had no idea what any of your beats sounded like. He just, you know, liked you as a person and wanted to see what kind of stuff you were coming up with. Yes, that was basically what happened. Yep, yep. That's awesome. What is he like as a person? Oh, man, he's he's a very smart guy. He's probably one of the smartest hip-hop artists, you know, you'd ever meet. Um, very smart, very intelligent, um, well-spoken. Um, and he loves to have conversation, you know, and he's very friendly, very friendly guy. That's awesome. So the guy from Terror Squad, you said Cuban Link is his name? Yep, Cuban Link. So is that's the that's the first like big name guy that you produced a beat for? Yep, that was the first big name guy. Um, we ended up working on some stuff, and it never came out on his album that he he released. Um, but we did end up working on some stuff inside the studio, and uh, I was in the studio for probably a week with him. So who was the next person after that? So it was there kind of like just like an order of like kind of bigger name guys that kind of kept falling into place after that. Yeah, after that, it kind of just, like, it kind of snowballed. Once Immortal Technique hit, he called me and and said he had a surprise for me and told me that uh, he's got some rappers on there that I would know on, you know, featuring on that song. And I was really surprised, and I I couldn't wait to hear it. So when he put it, when he released it, um, it ended up being Buckshot and Smith & Wesson um, from the Boot Camp Click which are, you know, phenomenal rappers um, from New York. And uh, we ended up, I remember seeing them at a concert and we ended up politicking and talking to one of each other. And then we ended up doing some stuff um, together. And then um, I ended up doing an interview in Boston um, and ran into um, Sean Price. And Sean Price told me uh i told him that i did this the song with him world technique smith and weston and buckshot and uh he ended up saying he was supposed to get on it on it you know rest in peace sean p but uh he had said he was going to get on it but his verses were too ignorant so they wouldn't let him on it that's what they said Um, yeah that's what they said (laughs) so uh, they wouldn't let him on the the track he wasn't woke enough um, yeah so we, we ended up doing some stuff um I sent some stuff to Sean Price, but we never ended up getting together and doing anything. But Smith and Wesson, we did 
do some stuff. And then uh, I have a, a good friend of mine who's a phenomenal rapper, an MC. His name is Beast1333. And uh, he hooked me up with the KRS-One uh, verse where I ended up doing something with KRS-One. Um, and awesome. he was part of the whole hip hop, um, Temple of Hip Hop. And if you ever get a chance, definitely check out his music, Beast 1333. Yeah, well, for sure. And what's the, name of the, what's the name of the song that you did with Immortal Technique? It's called uh, Military Minds. Okay. Featuring... There's a YouTube video for that? Yep, there's a YouTube video. Cool. It's called yep, Military Minds featuring Smith & Wesson and Buckshot. Cool. We'll put the link to that in the description so people can check it out. And what's the KRS-One song? Um, that's actually on my album. Um, that's called... Um, my name, my name is, and it's a, it's basically a tribute to KRS One, and it's, uh, it's KRS One and featuring Beast Thirteen Thirty Three. Cool, and that's the under the Alien Religion name. That's actually under King Solomon. Uh, oh, okay. the Big Picture. Yep, Big Picture Two. Wait, so what is Alien Religion? That's your production company. Now, Alien Religion is a group that I put together, um, for it's it's different product different producers that I work with and we create different stuff and we, and, and uh, basically we come up with some different, different uh, type of music, but it's, it's called uh, yeah, alien religion. Awesome. Awesome. I will definitely include links for all of this in the description. Yeah. Um, so another thing I wanted to ask you about is when you were going through a lot of these experiences, meeting these guys, making beats for people and whatnot, this was all in the early to mid two thousands. Yes. Yep. Okay, so because yep. obviously the internet was drastically different back then than it is now, which is it's amazing to think how far it's come in just 20 years. But you know, nowadays when people make beats and stuff like that, everybody's got you know an Instagram, they have like their YouTube page, they have all these different devices for getting their stuff out there. How much different was it back then for you compared to how it is now? Uh, it's a lot different. Um, I feel like I got most of my connects and everything actually going to concerts and shows. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like these days, everything's a little more internet. Um, right. You know, you can just Instagram, you know, you can basically just direct message people now these days and they'll get you back to you. Um, and you can talk to them and, and send them stuff, you know. Um, but me, I, I do most of my, you know, most of my connects at that time came from actually uh, going to the concert, seeing them and talking to them. Mm hmm I would imagine that's still probably even more effective nowadays too, because I'm sure a lot of people are just getting inundated with so many messages from people and it's probably overwhelming. I'm sure nothing can really replace that experience of seeing someone in person, shaking their hand, having a conversation, really getting a feel for each other's vibes and going from there, oh, yeah. you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, you get to know who the person is too, in a way, you know, like I feel like with that, um, kind of get an idea of how they're, you know, how, how they're, uh, the aura is, you know, mm -hmm. some, some people you don't want to meet because of the way they are, you know, sometimes yeah. it's what they say, sometimes it's best to not meet some of your heroes. You know? Have you had you experiences know? like that with a lot of people that you've made beats for? Um, no, not really. Um, I've had a couple experiences with some people um, taking off, not paying, not or sending stuff and, and never getting back you know, that type of stuff, uh, wait, waiting for a verse, you know, and it's been like two years, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> right. You know? so, um, uh, some of that stuff. Are you typically always meeting these rappers in person or are some of them just sending stuff over the internet? Um, I'm, I'm trying to meet them as much as possible, you know, as mm -hmm. in person. Um, but some of them I do over the internet, just over the internet. So when you're meeting in person, is the process a lot different? Like, are you more getting a feel for each other and showing each other some ideas that you came up with? Yeah, I, I feel like that's a lot better. Um, the vibe feels a lot better. You know, it's just it's just that human vibe. You know what I mean? Like that, that energy, you know, in the room and right. be able to build, you know, it's completely different than sending somebody a track and then sending it back and then sending it again. You know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a different vibe. Different so energy. have you met KRS-One? Actually, I have. I've met him a couple times. Um, I met him at Toad's place. Um, we talked a little bit about the stuff. Um, he's 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 a real nice guy. Harris One is really nice. He's the most friendliest guy I think I've. He's 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 like he reminds me a lot of Moral Technique. They're just really mm -hmm. friendly guys, willing to talk. They talk to you for hours. You know. 
yeah, prior to hearing his music, I had always seen him on like these documentaries and he always seemed like a very conscious guy, very much a truth seeker. And, you know, so I could yeah. totally see what you're saying, you know, some similar, like you said, similar to a mortal technique. Yep. Yep. Um, so when, when you're making a beat, because, you know, you're a jazz musician, you're not just a producer, you know, a lot of people that are producing now don't even really play instruments. So is your process, do you feel like it's different because you know how to play, you know, instruments as opposed to somebody who's just kind of just making beats on their own with no musical knowledge? That's interesting. Um, I think, I think it is because I always have a lot in my head. You know, I have, I have a lot. And I think it's different for the fact that it's never what I'm building on. It's, for me, it's always what I have to take away because there's so much going in. I think with other artists that, that don't have that background, you know, it's, they're, they're building on top of stuff they're creating on top. Mm-hmm. With me, it's just too much, you know, so I have to take away, you know, to different. Will you sometimes like sit down with your MIDI keyboard and just start playing stuff as if it, you were just playing piano and see if you come up with a, like an idea for like maybe a progression or something for a beat off of that? Yeah, basically mm-hmm. that, or sometimes uh, there's so many different progressions because as you know, cause you're, you're a jazz musician, you learn a lot of different progressions and stuff, um, different, different substitute changes and stuff. And we're, you know, I'm always looking at how I can fit that in, you know, is, or mm-hmm. if I can, you know, right. um, so it, it's, it's, re- it's, it's, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot to think about. There's a lot there on the plate, you know, and, and just trying to figure out how to make less of it you know, right. so I can make room for the rapper. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know? So what program do you use now? Um, right now I'm using the Akai uh, MPCX, you know, I'm doing a lot of my, my production on that and it's got like a software in it. And um, I do a lot. I, I basically do most of the production on there and then I would transfer it over to, uh, to Logic X and I use Logic, Logic X to like, uh, to kind of like, um how do you say sequence it sequence it out a little you know Mm -hmm. do you have any favorite plugins um i don't really have too many favorite plugins that i use um not too many i like i mean again you know i use the the simple what everyone else because i'm old school so i kind of keep it that same way so uh, you know the usual eqs you know what i mean and Mm -hmm. and limiters and gates but uh, I kind of keep it to that kind of stuff, you know. There's nothing really right. you know, special as long as it gets the job done. <laughs> you know? yeah, that's that's all that matters, right? <laughs> so you you hear a lot of stories about producers not getting credited for stuff that they do. Um, do you have any firsthand experiences of that happening to you? And if not, do you have any uh, stories of fellow producers that that's happened to that you'd be willing to share? Yeah, um, I, it's happened to me a couple times. Uh, um, one of the times it happened was with, uh, I did a track with, uh, it was very interesting. Um, this, this happened and, and I thought it wasn't going to happen again and it actually did. So I was working at a studio, um, with this guy and, and he was telling me, yeah, you know, don't worry, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll pay you for your tracks. If anyone ever comes, buys them, you know? And I was like, great. So he had a folder with my name on it. And I was throwing him tracks and, you know, whoever's came into the studio would check out this music. And if they liked it, he'd call me and say, listen, how much would this beat is or whatever. You know? um, so I, I talked to him for a little while and I said, listen, man, has anyone sold anything? Cause it was going for like a couple months this way. And he goes, nah, nothing's really going, you know, just keep creating. So I said, all right. So I just kept creating, kept creating. Um, and then I got a call from one of my friends and he said, listen, um there's this guy a famous rapper on your beat his name is max b when did you give something i didn't know you worked with max b and i said no i I never did i never worked with max b are you sure it's mine you know and he was like no it is man this thing is like playing all over the hood and it's playing there and it's playing there and i'm like no i don't don't think it's my beat and he played over the phone and it was (laughs) it was my beat um so I ended up going to talk to the guy because I knew exactly. I said, wait a minute, I, I know where this beat came from. So I called the guy up at the studio and the guy was like, oh man, you know, I apologize. It, it happened all of a sudden. It was one of those quick things. I didn't even get to call you and tell you um, what was going on. And, you know, it never happened again and all this stuff. And I was like, all right. 
so I was like, are we, are we getting paid for this? You know, how much, how much am I getting paid for this? And he goes, well, I have to ask him. And uh, he never got back to me, never got back to me. So yeah, after so that, I stopped, I stopped giving him beats after that. Cause I was like, no, there's no way. Uh, the fact he is, he, ne- he never called me back about how much I get paid for this beat or anything right. like that. That's um, ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I let it go and, and, you know, months go by and then somebody else calls me and says, man, I, there's a track with you. You know, I, I didn't know you worked with these kind of guys. And I said, what, what kind of guys are you talking about? And he goes, um, if you get a chance, definitely uh, it's your beat. I know it's your beat. And I said, well, who's on it? And he said, well, it's Hellrell and Uncle Murder. I said, Hellrell and Uncle Murder? Are they're on my beats? I said, I, I never gave him a beat. Come to happen, it's the same guy, the same studio. Uh, sold them the beat, got the money for it, said he did the track. And wow. uh, yeah, it was basically the ending of our, you know, our conversation and our situation, you know. Was it a different beat from the first one? It was a different beat. It was oh, so you, how many beats did you give him? Um, I, I, I would probably say 35, 40 beats. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I was creating them in the studio and I would just leave them there and say, listen, this is the beat. It's done. And send it to them and say, listen, is there any problems with it? Or if you need a mix down, let me know, you know. Um, but these are the ideas. And, and, you know, he ran with it. So how does that work when you're giving your beats to a studio? So you, you give him the beats and then he has all these connections that he can offer these beats to. And then if he sells them, you get a, he, he takes a cut and you get a percentage as well. Yeah. That's, that's basically what we had in mind. You know, mm-hmm. we would, we would do that. He, whoever he had coming into the studio, he would try to push some beats on to and, and have them check if they need anything, you know? Um, and then from there we would talk, say listen how much you know how much would you could you give for this beat and we would split it you know um at that time i was i was still you know i, I didn't know who to run into i was i would just finish the immortal technique thing and i was just kind of like trying to find a like a home like a studio that i can work out of you know permanently mm-hmm. so i didn't have to you know i was living you know at that time the place i was living didn't really wasn't really a studio you know what i mean wasn't really a, a good studio right. or anything so I was looking basically for a home to sit down and work out of. And he was like, yeah, you know, this would be a perfect spot, you know? So that's what we did. And uh, yeah, it didn't work out very well. So how does it work as far as like uh, the beats being copyright and stuff like that? Like what, I mean, obviously it was a small incident, but were were you in a position where you could have taken legal action if you wanted to? Um, I definitely could, you know, obviously with the money, it's, it's, it's tough because you have to pay for a lawyer. It's, it's not, it's not, it's not a simple process. They never make anything simple, you know? Right. Um, but yes, you could, it's a legal process. And I, I could, I definitely probably definitely would have won the case for the fact that I had all the, you know, I, I had all the beats, I had all the stems to it, you know? Right. Um, so it, it was no problems with that, but it was just fighting the whole legal battle with the situation would have been a disaster, you know? Um, a lot of people do that. They, they end up not even bothering once the beat's out. You know, um, a lot of producers that, that do get it robbed from their beats don't even bother because it's just the production and, and the process is just too long. You know, to take. Right. How do you go about copywriting your own beats? Um, right now, they, they have like, you can do it on the website. I, I used to do it old school all the time. Um, sending it to, I would send like, they, they would have like a paper that I would print out from copyright um, down in, in, in Washington, DC, you know, and I would write all the names down. And this is like, you know, old time. And then, you know, put them all in and send it in with, you know, I think it's like 55 bucks or something like that. And they would all get processed with the CD, you know, of, of the music. Oh, it was 55 for the entire CD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, that's good. I, I was going to say $55 a beat, that would be crazy. <laughs> well, you know what? They they the way you get through that is is you use the CD as you say the CD is a whole um it's a song. The whole CD is mm-hmm. one song. That's basically. So you copyright the song which has like, you know, 30 beats. You know what I mean or whatever it mm-hmm. was, you know. 
So you copyright that one song, which has like 30 beats and every beat in that song, you know, is a phrase. So if thing, oh, cool. anything happens, you don't have to worry about it instead of having like 55 every single song, you know? So it's just one long track. That's all the beats. Yes. Yep. Yep. It's good that's to know. It. <laughs> it's good yeah, to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I did it. Now I think it's done a little different though. Now I think you pay a pay a year or something and you have, you know, some type of unlimited thing that you just type on the computer and send it in, you know, and then they give you a, they give you back. Um, I used to get like a little thing, but now they give you like a code. So mm-hmm. now your beat is now, you know, it's a number, you know, it's a certain mm. number. Now your beat, so it's a little different. You know? Nice. And just on the subject of the producers kind of getting screwed out of stuff, didn't, weren't you saying the other day that you, there, you have a story about something happening with 50 cent involving that? Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it's very interesting. It's the same guy. Um, so wow. same studio. <laughs> um, is that studio still around? No, it is. Oh, that's good. It's not around anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 done. Um, but uh, yeah, Fifty Cent, his A and R came, and um, she was listening to some of the beats at that studio. And uh, this is the one time where he actually called me and said, "Hey, you know, we have Fifty Cent, one of Fifty Cent's A uh, and R's in here, and she's interested to check out a beat." And I was like, "That's that's great, you know." So I came in. And uh, listened to it for a while. And she loved it. Really loved the beat. And she was like, you know what? Uh, I can send this to like G Unit, you know. But this would be good for Fifty because wow. he's coming back. And this, you know, the, the way the song sounds, it's got like a Spanish vibe to it. Um, and I was like, okay, that that's great, you know. And she said, well, I just want to say you're not you're not the producer. I'm going to end up being the producer. On and I said, hold on a second. Why, why would that happen? Um, and she said, well, because I have the vision. So because I have the vision, that means I'm the producer. So she wanted to take the credit because she had the vision of the song. So I had tell her, I said, listen, I know you have a vision for it, but you never asked to see if I had a vision for it. Obviously, I must if I made the beat. So if I made the beat, then there's no reason for me to not come up with a vision for this, you know. Um, And I understand your vision, but that's not going to work, you know. Um, For the fact that I, you know, again, I'm looking for my producer's rights. You know what I mean? I'm the one that actually made the beat. I sat there, had the idea, I cut it up, I did everything. so we went back and forth for a little while and then I, you know, I kind of just relaxed with everything and I said, all right, let's see where else she goes with this. And then she wanted, you know, she didn't really want to pay for the beat. And then that's where things got kind of like, no, no, you know, I'm good. I'm going to hold on to it, you know. And uh, I never, never approached her after that. You know, she never approached me again after that. But she was like, yeah, I have, you know, she tried to, it was very like, it was almost like she tried to like, like strong army, you know, it was really mm. interesting. She was like, yeah, why, well, I have other producers, you know, around that make beats and they, they have no problems, you know, getting these beats to 50 or getting this stuff, you know, I can get it to anybody, you know? So it was really interesting how the, how, you know, she was, her, her thing was to like kind of put you in a corner and strong arm you out of your music, you know? Um, I feel like a lot of A&Rs, they, they, they tend to try to do that, you know? So you got to be careful with that, that type of thing happening. It's such a weird position to put you in too, because she didn't really give you any scenario where it was appealing for you to say yes. You know, she's not going to give you credit. She didn't want to pay for the beat. I mean, what reason would you have for giving her that beat? <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. It was it was almost like she wanted to be star. You know, she wanted me to be starstruck with the name, Fifty Cent, and then from the straight the name, she wanted me to be like, well, because it's Fifty, I should probably give it to him. You know, it doesn't matter if it's free or not. Um, when actuality, you know, again, you know you got to have some type of worth, you know what I mean, in this game and kind of put your foot down to show that you're worth something, especially when you're coming up in this stuff. So uh, I had to say no, you know. So when you're looking at the liner notes of a lot of these albums and you're seeing the production credits and stuff like that, a lot of those could just be lies? Yes, a lot of those can definitely be lies. A lot of them can be somebody else producing it. Um, It just happens to happen that way. You know, it, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, you could turn a knob, you know, depending on who the, the producer, you know, whoever you're with, the, the big name person, 
or the big name producer you're with, depending on who it is, if they turn a knob, they can tell you that's that it's their beat now. You know, wow. if they add an instrument in, you know, they say, well, I just produced this because I just added this instrument. Without this instrument, it wouldn't be anything. And that's actually and legal to do? It, it's funny to say this, but it is. Some, most producers are like, okay, you know. Um, a lot of the beats, a lot of the beats that, uh, that um, Dr. Dre had in his 2000, 2001 album, The Chronic, was done really by, uh, by Scott Storch. The bass player? Uh, Scott Storch, no, he's, uh, he, he does, he does a lot of, he used to play, he used to, he's a piano player, he used to play with, with uh, the Roots uh, for a little while, but a lot of those beats were actually done by him on the 2001 Chronic album, um, mm -hmm. but it says produced by Dr. Dre, you know. Right, there's so, a big deal with the bass player on that album as well, right, isn't there some yes. sort of weird story surrounding him? The same thing, yeah. The, the feel, what happened with him is that they ended up leaving. Uh, I heard, what I've heard is Dr. Dre left, Dr. Dre said he didn't need him anymore because he was, you know, he, he wanted more of a cut from what he was playing. And he was telling him that he was creating the vibe of the albums. And uh, Dr. Dre was like, nah, you know, I, I'll get somebody else. Um, Dr. Dre did, fired him, got someone else. And uh, it didn't turn out the same. So, Dr. Dre actually came back and rehired him, you know, and he's back with Dr. Dre. But yeah, it tends that tends to happen a lot. Was he trying out bass players for individual tracks, or was it for that that two that uh, Compton album? Uh, I think it was for. I want to say with, with Dre, you don't know because he's he's constantly. I mean, he has over thousands of tracks, unheard tracks. So mm -hmm. I think he was just creating music. You know, what I mean, like he was just creating, and. Um, what he was creating he just did you know it didn't have the same vibe that you know that it was with that bass player i think his name is eli right or something like that. i'm not sure i forget his name i'll have to look into yeah, it but um yeah so i think he was creating you know it just didn't have that same that same vibe you know it, yeah. it changed it, i think it changed dre's music a lot you know do you ever do stuff like that when you're making beats like will you have like a you know a live bass player or a guitar player or some live instruments I do. I do, actually. Um, I'm working with this phenomenal bass player right now, um, Lawrence White. He's a, he's a really great bass player from around the area. Um, I love working with guitar players, too. Hopefully, I'll have you on a track. Can't wait. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I just got to avoid that tarantula in your house. <laughs> as right. long as you can do that. <laughs> That's right. We'll keep him upstairs while we work downstairs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I, I love working with guitar players, too. Um, I just, I just did the track, uh, for Ali Vegas, who's, you know, he's written for everybody. Um, Kobe Bryant, he's written for everybody. You name it. He's written for them. Um, left eye. From TLC. He's written, written for, for Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Kobe Bryant. If you ever get a chance, he, he put out, he put out a hip hop album back in the day. And Kobe Bryant did? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so for the lyrics, the lyrics were written actually by Ali Vegas. Um, so, um, so I'm working with him now and, uh, I just did a track with him and I put, um, Jonathan Powell, a phenomenal trumpet player. Um, is he related to Doobie Powell? No, he isn't. He's, oh, okay. he's, uh, yeah, no relation. Um, but, uh, Jonathan Powell is a phenomenal trumpet player. Um, and, uh, the track came out, it came out killing, you know, and we're, me and Ali are just, me and Ali Vegas are finishing up a duo album right now um in the middle of it um about 20 songs so 10 of them will be uh like just real strong hip-hop boom back type of feel and then the other 10 is going to be a little more um like just showing his versatility in writing you know so giving him different types of beats and he's going to write over them that's awesome. And I, I've listened to a lot of your stuff and I love the vibe because it brings me back to a lot of that early 2000s rap, which was, you know, I grew up in that era and I love that. Do you do um, any sort of production stuff that's like more along the lines of like what a lot of people are doing now, like with the 808 bass and stuff like that? You know what? I, I, I don't. Um, I, I, I tend to do what I, what I grew up in. You know, I right. kind of keep it that way. It's enough just working with that in itself. You know, um, very strong. Um, 
All right, you ready to get you ready to get into the ready Yeah, well, the, let's do it. Yeah, let it out. <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not a usually a, I'm not a big fan of what's happening today, to be quite honest right. with you, with the music. Um I respect the trap music, but lyrically, um and the way, you know, the the stuff is going with making the beats, you know, um to me is becoming a lot more simpler and less uh, more electronic than it is soul, you know, coming through. Um these days so i'm not really into what's going on today you know um it's their own genre you know what i mean i don't i don't even really call it hip-hop i kind of just call it trap music you know are there any newer guys that you do like like any newer producers or rap i mean obviously i know you like kendrick um, yes i love kendrick um i love kendrick i love joey badass uh newer guys uh, that's that's a tough one um Big Crit. Big Crit is... Oh, he's, he's amazing. He's, he's phenomenal. Um, Production-wise, too. He's a phenomenal producer. Does he produce most of that stuff himself? He does. He does. He does most of his production himself. Um, I always like B.O.B., even though he's not new. Um, big fan of B.O.B. Um, but uh, a lot of the other guys, I got to say, I'm not not really too, you know don't really impress me yeah. yeah it's weird too because a lot of the younger kids they all listen to rap now and a lot of times i'll pick their brain a little bit about different rappers see who they like and most recently eminem came out with that music to be murdered by album which i loved and i asked a couple of the kids i was like would you did you listen to the new eminem album and most of the kids don't like eminem like they think he's like a bad rapper and they're just like yeah all he does is rap fast you know i'm just like do you have any idea like the substance of what he's saying and those but then they'll listen to like mumble rap and they love it you know so i think a lot of the younger kids now they're much more interested in like not really the substance of the music but more so like just a vibe like to get like a vibe going with like a beat you don't even really have to pay attention to the lyrics because they're just mumbling through it and it seems like that's kind of the shift that's happened so i can totally understand where you're coming from saying that you're not crazy about a lot of the stuff you know that's going on nowadays yeah i agree i think i think it's it's more vibe music or what they feel at that moment, you know, um, and, and it just seems like, you know, there's not as much effort and time put into it, you know, as it, as it mm -hmm. was back in the day. I mean, we can, we can even go back. I mean, we don't even have to start. I mean, everyone talks about Nas and Biggie, you know, Pac, we can go back to, to uh, Rakim, you know, and Big Daddy Kane, you know, Kooji rap. Um, one of the most incredible lyricists, you know, ever, you know, back then too. So, I mean, to me, I want to see more of it going towards actually writing, you know, because when I think about hip hop, I think about the writing, you know, I think about the substance, I think about mm -hmm. what they're trying to say, what they're trying to get out, you know, um, and the way they do it, you know, today, it seems like everyone sounds kind of the same, you know, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I know me growing up, I sound old, but growing up like in the nineties, era you know um 80s and 90s it's it, it it always had like the west coast had its own sound you know mm -hmm. the south side had its own sound the east coast had its own sound you know um you can never get tired of listening to hip-hop because hip-hop was all those sounds you know so mm -hmm. let's say if i was listening to you know wu-tang in the east coast you know and i was okay i'm done listening to wu-tang i can go um, you know, who's from Shallon, I can go to Brooklyn and, and end up listening to, you know, Smith and Weston and Buckshot, you know, and, and, and the boot camp. And if I got tired of listening to them, you know, I, I can go listen to, uh, you know, the Bronx, you know, you had, you had people coming out the Bronx, KRS one, you know, big pun, um, completely different, different vibes, different energy. And then if you get tired of listening to that, you got West coast, you had Snoop Doggy, you know, you had Snoop Dogg, you had Dr. Dre, you had, uh, you had Exhibit, you know, you had, uh, you had, you had uh, DJ Quick, you know, who was phenomenal producer, um, you know, Warren G, all those guys, you know, with, with Nate Dogg, you know, um, you had all those guys. And then if you wanted South, you had, you know, Outkast, which is a completely different music mm. from your ear, you know, it's just right. hip hop, you know, was completely, you had them from all different sides and shapes. Now I think, it's really easy to get tired of listening to it because everything sounds the same. You know, if you go to the East, how can you tell the East from the West? You know, how can you tell right. the West? Yeah, that's a great point. 
it's very hard to, you know, because it's, you know, yes, the, the way they talk, you know, you can tell a little bit by the way their slang is if you listen closely to, you know, Nipsey Hussle, um, he, he's, he's still got that West Coast swing in his, in the way he approaches the songs, you know, mm -hmm. um, but musically, production wise, it's very hard to tell. That makes perfect sense, too, because thinking about it now, I mean, when I was growing up listening to rap, it was in the early 2000s. And back then, like everybody had like a specific vibe. You know, I loved like DMX and Rough Riders and then, you know, Nelly and the St. Lunatics. And just thinking of it now, based on what you just said, I completely see like there was all these different vibes going on. And now you try to think of it like that in terms of today's music. It, it's just it all blends together. It's right. obviously it exceptions here and there, like Kendrick and, you right. know, but. And that's the yeah, and as I was just gonna say, that's why I consider like some of like the stuff that Kendrick, you know, to Pimple Butterfly to me was a classic album. You know, is is to me that's what makes it a classic album. Is it's nothing like it. You know, there's nothing like it, and not just that, but you can tell he put a lot of thought. Um, the album is 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 a you know, it's it's really hard to find these type of albums too. Everyone's looking for hits instead of like um, albums that have like. Uh, auras to them you know it, they all had they've all tell the story the whole album tells the story you know what i mean like it's very like if you listen to that kendrick you know he's he's telling a poem throughout the whole mm -hmm. album and through, throughout the whole album he's, he's telling his struggles actually in you know the the industry you know dealing with women and and, and hip-hop in general you know and how he first the first song he says when he can't wait to get put on what he's gonna do and his first love is hip-hop you know he's that's the first song he starts off with um and it's just basically the, the whole album is just it's, it's, it's conceptual, you know. It's, it's it's very much so. And a lot of those albums, to me, you know, that that's what makes it such a classic album. And mm -hmm. these days, I think these rappers now are just looking for one hit. You know, they, right. the whole album can't be a hit. You know what I mean? Like you got to have, you know, you got to have the high down, you know, low points. You know what I mean? You got to have. It's got to be like a movie. You know, imagine a movie being all straight up action. You know what I mean? You, you, right. Like, damn. <laughs> you, know, you, get, right. you get, you know, you're like, damn, I need a part to, to breathe or, you know, a storyline. You know, give me a storyline. You know what I mean? Um, so that's kind of like what I feel Kendrick is doing with some of his albums, you know. Um, the Compton's album, the Dr. Dre last one, I thought was one of the most slept on albums. I think it's a that classic. Awesome. Um, and it's the same thing with that album. It's, it's so it's got its high points it's got its low points it's it's a very much well thought out album you know great features um, concept album yeah great features and it's a great concept album you know so that's kind of like what i think it's missing you know that album surprised me too because like you said i feel like it was very slept on i remember when it first came out like nobody talked about it and dre was like flat out saying like this is going to be my last solo album and nobody even like talked about it when it came out I found out about it from like a Facebook ad. I was scrolling through Facebook one day and I saw this ad. It's like Dr. Dre's final studio album. And it was just like a little clip of him talking about it. And it had like 30 likes. I was like, what is this? How, am I, how have I not heard about this yet? Wow. Yeah, I found, I found out about it. Um, I'm a huge Dr. Dre fan. So I've mm -hmm. been waiting for this forever, you know. So when he said he was going to drop it for, you know, for the, uh, for the movie, you know. And I've heard all the, you know, all the controversy behind it because he didn't want to, he didn't even want to do that, to be honest with you. They kind of forced him. Um, and, and, you know, knowing Dre, being a perfectionist that he is, you know, he's, he's very, he's very careful at what he lets out, you know, very, very careful of what he puts out. Um, if he, if he doesn't like it or it doesn't really hit too much, he wills it in. But that was one thing that I think they kind of forced him and to me it was a classic thing. Thank goodness they did. <laughs> I'm happy they did. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think he was probably, I think he was 50 when that album came out, either late 40s, early 50s. Yeah. Um, but I, I love seeing that. I love seeing these guys that we grew up with still killing it. I mean, that new Eminem album, you could say what you want about it, but you can't deny the fact that lyrically and just his rapping ability is still just at the top of its game. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can't even put, and it's it's sad to say this, but the, you know, if the kids really sit down and start listening, um, it, it's impossible to for them to put any of their rappers up against this guy. You know, Eminem is is one of the one of the greatest ever, you know, on the face of this planet to ever do hip hop music. I think it has to be a little bit of a generational divide too, because I tell younger kids, it's like when I was younger, I think I was in 
first grade when, or I was either in kindergarten or first grade when uh, My Name Is came out and then The Real Slim Shady. And I tell him, I was like, you have no idea how huge that was when it came out and how controversial he was. I mean, you know, everyone talks about Donald Trump now and that's like the, the big controversy now, but it's like, that was like the original, like Donald Trump. I feel like when Eminem first came out, everyone was freaking out. N nobody knew what to make of it, you know? Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, Dre knew what to do with him. You know, Dre did a phenomenal job producing him and coming out the way he did with him. Um, and I, you know, you talk to, you know, I'm, some of the interviews that M talks about, you know, it's, it's great to see that he was trying to push the envelope. He didn't want to be like anybody else. And again, that stuck him out. You know, he wanted to push the envelope. How, how much can I take this hip hop? Where can I take it? How much would mm. be accepted? You know, and, and he, just himself to be able to talk. I mean, I mean, the stuff that he was saying about his mother at that time, you know what I mean? He was like, yeah, and his ex-wife too. <laughs> yeah, his ex-wife, you know, killing her. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a dark song. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's got a lot of stuff. Um, you know, all the drug stuff that he was talking about. You know, that that mm -hmm. song "Conscious" was was phenomenal when, when uh, you know, Dr. Dre is his conscience. You know, and he's telling him not to do certain things, and he's got, oh, like, uh, guilt, yeah. guilty conscience. Guilty conscience. Yeah. I mean, that's that right there in itself. I mean, that's that's genius, you know, to come mm. up with a concept that way, you know what I mean? Like, so he was just, he was coming up with concepts. He was pushing the envelope, you know, on what you can say, you know, and, 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 you know, we, we embraced it, you know what I mean? It, right. it should be embraced, you know, cause that's what hip hop's about. I think that's what it's all about at the end of the day. And it's funny cause everyone calls him Eminem now, but he had all these different alter egos depending on what you were listening to. I remember like my dad, back when he heard me listening to Eminem, he always referred to him as Slim Shady. Some people would call him Marshall Mathers. <laughs> you know, it was just like right. the idea of all these different- um, Alter egos. Persona, yeah, alter egos that he's going off of too. Yes, you know, I um, mean, that's, that's phenomenal, like thinking about that, you know? Yeah, and, and he's a true student too of, I mean, anytime you watch an interview with him, he loves the art form of rap. And even recently he did a little, video i think it was called music to be quarantined by and he was just going through like a bunch of recommendations of listening uh while everyone's going through this and the amount of stuff he named that i've never even heard of i couldn't even believe i mean he's truly one of these guys that's just constantly exploring music trying to find new stuff and i saw an interview with him where he even said like you know on a given saturday if he has like an entire saturday off it's not unusual for him just to spend an entire saturday going through all of the newest stuff, trying to find stuff that he likes, even digging through some old stuff. So you could, I mean, you could tell there's a true genuine love for the art with him. Oh yeah, he definitely is. And, and, and that's why like, you know, again, I have, I have problems with a lot of the new stuff for the fact that you can tell, like he goes back, he can, you know, what, what new rapper now talks about Naughty by Nature, you know, the way he, right. the way Eminem talks about Trek, you know what I mean? Um, and, and this, this is, this is being a student of the actual art form itself, you know, and this to me, first and foremost, hip hop is an art form and, and, and to have these guys come in and not know, you know, who, you know, who Tretch is from Naughty by Nature or, you know, who uh, Grandmaster Flash is, you know, or who Chaji Gaddafi is, or, uh, you know, African Bumbada and, and not know any of these guys stuff and this material, you know what I mean? It's, it's mind boggling because I'm, I'm a strong believer that, if the, you know, if the, the tree doesn't have roots, it's going to die. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. you got it. Everything comes from the roots. You know, if you haven't studied the roots, you know, it's just like, you know, in hip hop, I mean, uh, in jazz, the same thing, right. you know, we, we go back, we have to go back and listen. If we're doing bebop, we got to go back and listen to Charlie Parker. We got to go be listening to Bob Powell, you know, um, Grant Green, we got to go back to listen before we can go forward. You know what I mean? So we have yeah. a big an understanding of of the music and the culture and, and respect um, for what we're what we're going. You know, before we approach this music, you know, and, and I think that's very important. I think it's missing in in today's music. You know, I mean, if you think about it in rock music, it's 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 happening in rock music. You know, it, that's why they're able to progress. That's why rock music will never you know, guy or, or, this is, or it's having problems or people don't like it or, you know, it, it, because everyone in the rock industry have like, you know, they've listened to the Beatles. They've listened to Guns N' Roses. They listen, they, they know all that Metallica, you know, they grew up, they study, you know, um, and this music, it's almost like, it sucks to say this, but, but it's almost as if it's getting thrown away in a, in a, in a way that, you know, they, they tell you, you don't study, you don't have to study, you just create, you know, in reality, it doesn't happen that way. Nothing really happens that way. Yes, you, you can create, but 
um, if you really want to take the art form seriously, you know what I mean? You have to go and study. You know? and, and the irony is the time that we're living in makes it easier than ever to actually study and find out all of this information regarding the art, you know? And it's, it's funny because it seems like rap music is one of the few genres where it, it's almost like normal for people to not really know the roots. Whereas if like, if we were playing a gig with somebody, we're playing a jazz gig and like, we found out that the guy didn't know who Charlie Parker was, it would, we wouldn't even be able to like, believe it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, like you said, yeah. you mentioned naughty by nature to like a young rapper. They don't know it. It's, it's normal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you go Kevin Karras one, you know, these guys don't know. It's so interesting because like, I'm running into more and more people that, you know, know less and less about you know who jay-z is and to me that's not even like a beginning you know what i mean like that's not even close <laughs> to the beginning right. but the fact is they don't even have heard you know a jay-z album but they haven't heard his first you know his first album reasonable doubt you know what i mean it's it's mind-boggling mm -hmm. to me um that you have these guys out here that haven't haven't studied the music and they're considered you know uh, the top artist artist of the day you know yeah, and it's interesting because I feel like whenever you get into a style of music, if you're listening to it based off of what you're currently hearing, a lot of times if you go back and you hear the roots of it, it, it might surprise you. And for some people, it might be off-putting. So I'm sure a lot of these kids are listening to this trap music and this really heavy, you know, 808 heavy rap stuff. And then they go back and they listen to like, you know, Naughty by Nature or Tupac or something. And they're just like, wait, wait, this is rap also? You know, but it's like, you had to have that to get where you are today. And like, those are, like you said, those are the roots. You have to understand where everything is coming from. Yeah. And I, and I think it can also bring it to another place. You know what I mean? Like if these kids really did this, their homework, I think music. And I, and I think that's why I respect Kendrick so much. Cause I know I can tell, I can listen, I can hear it in his, in his rhyming, you know, how much appreciation he has for the music mm -hmm. and how he's, he has his strong roots, his strong background. Right. Um, so I'm starting to see that a lot within these kids. Um, I mean, with, within that, and, and it's to these days for the music to keep progressing, I think, you know what I mean? You definitely need to go back, you know, before you can go forward, you know, that kind of vibe. Absolutely. Does Kendrick say that Nas is his favorite rapper? Um, I'm not sure who he he's says is his favorite. I know he's, uh, He's got a couple of them. You know, I think, I definitely think he loves Nas. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I think he has a couple guys that he, you know, he really likes, you know. But uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, Kendrick's definitely influenced a lot by the West Coast guys like Snoop Dogg, you know, all those kind of cats too. Um, mm -hmm. um, Does Kendrick Cat. live on the West Coast or is he in New York? Yeah, he lives in the West Coast. He's, he's from LA. He's actually from Compton. With, with oh, Dr. right, Trump. right. Of course. Right. Yeah, he's from that. Yeah. So it's it's interesting, like how, to me, I find it, it's interesting because like, I'm starting to get a lot of the parallels from the same stuff with the jazz too, you know, of, of the, a lot of people now are saying you don't have to go back to Bud Powell, you know what I mean, the, the roots of, of, of bebop, which is really interesting, you know, I'm starting to see this, the parallels between hip hop and jazz are becoming very similar you know, in a lot of different ways. Hmm, that's not good. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a little scary. <laughs> I'm, finding, I'm finding more and more jazz musicians that, you know, say they haven't studied, you know, Bud Powell or they haven't studied uh, Red Garlic, you know, or, or Wayne Kelly, or, you know. So it's, it's really interesting. You know, we're living in some interesting times right now. Yeah, I mean, and you have to study that because even if you like more of the modern guys, there's a progression that they have followed and it all came from the same place. So you need, like you, you know, like you said, the roots, you have to know where the roots come from if you want to have a better understanding. And you don't necessarily have to take that and play like that and, you know, focus strictly on that, but at least having an understanding of it and then going off and doing your own stuff and finding the stuff that you really want to do, it's going to be much stronger and much more firm and grounded because you have that root in place. Yes, I agree. I agree. And I think, I think that's what, you know, we, we kind of have to all go back to um, with, with, you know, with this hip hop. You know? mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I have a little string of questions I wanted to ask you kind of just very specific things. So do you have three favorite producers? Obviously, Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre is definitely one of them. Um, uh, do I have three of huh? Wow, that's tough, man. It's, it's, you can name it more than three and just whoever I, comes to mind. I would say um, Dr. Dre is definitely one. Um, RZA's another. I'm a huge RZA fan. Um, DJ Scratch, um, who did most of all the Busta Rhymes albums. Um, 
to me is, is probably one of my top favorites. Um, Jay Dilla is another one. Um, uh, Prince Paul uh, is another one. He did a lot of How about like rappers that make their own beats? You have any favorite rappers that also produce? RZA, of course. Um, and Big Crit is definitely another one. Um, he's one of my favorites right now that makes his own beats. Uh, I'll tell you that people don't like him, but Kanye, you know, I, whether or not people like what he does or what he stands for, or he could be crazy as anything, but I'll tell you his music, musically, and, and I mean, you can't beat his first two albums. You know what I mean? Those, those two Which first College two Dropout? College Dropout, yep, and uh, Late Registration. Right. Yeah. Which is the one with the cover with the the mascot? Is that College Dropout? Um, yes. Yeah. The one that has Through the Wire and Slow Jams and all those yes. Jesus Walks. Yeah. 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 That's an yeah. amazing yeah. album. Yes, that's amazing. And and to me, my favorite though was actually his second one, which was Late Registration, um, from a producer style. You know, um, the stuff on that album at the end if you check it out like he ends up changing the beats it's like it's mind-boggling like how you know just he just showed the concept of you don't have to keep the beat the same way through the whole entire song mm -hmm. you know you can change it up a little bit and create something else um so he's definitely one just blaze is another one that doesn't get enough respect i love just blaze just blaze to me is one of the most incredible uh, producers too awesome i'll have to check him out yeah. um how about three favorite rap albums Oh, wow. That's a tough one. Or it could be um, more than three, <laughs> whatever comes to mind. Ready to Die, definitely. Mm -hmm. Illmatic is another one. Uh, I would say Chronic. And, uh, of course, you know, Snoop Dogg, Doggy Style. And Wu Enter the Wu-Tang. Mm. Nice. All the classics. And probably the Outcast, classics. Southern Playlistic, Funky Luck, Cadillac music. And what Which one was the Outcast? It's uh, Southern Playlistic, Funky uh cadillac music i never heard of that is that their that's, an that's earlier their, one that's their first album oh their first, yeah their first album was a classic oh is it wait what's the and one that's it's course, like uh, the weird title that's 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 the, that's that was like number four i think that was oh like really album. yeah yeah Quimini, yeah yeah they have a ton of albums i mean they have a lot of yeah. stuff that you can dig into i i always wished that Andre 3000 would make a solo album because he does all these guest verses and he just murders everything. And I always, I mean, who knows, maybe he will at some point, but the outcast hasn't been doing anything for a long time. And I would imagine he's probably has a lot of stuff in the works. Yeah, I'm sure he does. What I heard, you know, which, which is interesting. I think they're tied up in their record, um, their company. Uh, they're supposed to release one more and they have a lot of music and they haven't done it. So there's problems with it them in the record company so they can release solo projects but they can't release or they can get on other people's albums but they cannot release an outcast album and they kind of don't want to so i think it's something to do with like i think it's a rista or something that they're on whatever album that there, there's like definitely some issue going on there hmm. so that's why you haven't heard anything from outcast and I feel like going off of what you had said about To Pimp a Butterfly, how there's like a, there's like a theme throughout the album and the whole album is telling you a story, like you were saying with a movie. And I feel like another good one that you can compare that to as well is Speaker Box and The Love Below. Oh man, those are classics. Yes, definitely. I mean, that's, we, you know, I think that was one of the last albums that they, they dropped, you know? Um, and to me, that's, if you can't, can't beat that album it, it's doing the exact same thing you know they're both telling stories phenomenal. yeah i forget which which side but the one that starts out with the um i think it's called love hater yeah and it starts with like a walking love. bass like a jazz groove it's like you're opening up right right out the gate with <laughs> some jazz stuff i love it do you know who produced that um i believe that was their producer was organized noise it's a phenomenal group organized noise um sleepy brown is a part of them um so I think they produced, but I have a feeling it says Andre might have produced that whole album, actually, Andre 3000. Hmm. Is it similar to what you had said about the, um, the 50 yeah. Cent? <laughs> yeah, I think it's the same, same situation. Well, so, so that it, pops up in a lot of albums. Yeah, I mean, there's stuff that people do. Like, they'll, they'll have the idea, you know, and they'll tell you to play an idea or they'll hum you something. 
and you got to play that. And then they say, yeah, that's it right there. And do this. And then there's, okay, that produced it. You know? That right. Kind of thing. Yeah, Eminem said that he does that because he doesn't play any instruments, but a lot of instrumentalists around him, it'll hum some things, see if they can, you know, copy it on the guitar or whatever instrument it is. So, yeah, interesting little workaround <laughs> for production yeah, credits. Definitely. Um, so speaking of Eminem, my next question was, do you have a favorite Eminem album? Um, his first, Slim Shady, is probably my yeah. favorite. Um, it's just because I think at that time period, how... Uh, groundbreaking it was you know it was mm -hmm. just you never heard anything like this at that time period you know um yeah. coming from somebody you know like him and the, the the combination between him and dre on that album will never be recreated i don't think um yeah. and to me it was just a classic yeah. have you heard his, i know you heard music to be murdered by did you also hear kamikaze and revival i did what did you think of those three like if you had to rank those three what would you put them in um probably used to be murdered by would be you know the first one and then i would probably do um kamikaze and then probably mm -hmm. revival and it's yeah. not that i don't take anything from revival i think revival was a phenomenal album too i think people slept on it because it was just different you know again he was he's trying to push the envelope you know what i mean he's been doing this for so long you know so right. musically he's coming across trying to trying to trying to come across different ways you know um so the album had a lot of like like popular guests i guess on it you know mm -hmm. um but he at that time what i liked is that he kind of explained what he was going through at that time he's just you know he's getting out of rehab he was going through a lot you know he's finally getting himself back together you know what i mean mm -hmm. from from being like through the rest of his albums which he was like you know he had pill problems and he was going through a lot you know with with women and i mean uh, you know so he's I mean, he's he had the problem with mariah carey you know what i mean so he's going through a lot and you can see it throughout his albums um so right. revival was kind of like all right i'm done with you know all the drama you know right and then kamikaze was basically the situation saying i've you know i've come all this far got clean did my thing you guys still don't respect me so right you know he basically went after everybody you know and it was pretty dope because with the trap beats he still murdered half of everybody on kamikaze that you know could, could rap right. on a trap beat um so to me it was like one of those things saying I, i'll kill you on your own stuff you know what i mean right and, and he then, even was saying too that like um because of the reaction to revival, if he hadn't gotten that negative reaction, it probably wouldn't have like lit that fire in him to make him want to do kamikaze. And he said that he saw similar parallels between um, the encore album and then the one after that. I think it's it's re uh, relapse, yeah, yes, relapse, yeah. and then recovery. Yeah. So he said if he didn't do um, encore, he never would have had relapse. You know. So he's seeing those parallels, and he he definitely said that he's one of these people where anger like really fuels his creativity. <laughs> so yeah. I feel like that negative reaction could have been a good thing in a way. Cause it got another album out of him <laughs> for us to yeah, enjoy. I, I agree. I agree. And then, and then of course, you know, music to be murdered by was, was to me was the most balanced, you know, of, of those three albums, you know, he, lyrically and musically, you know, um, he, you could tell, I could, I could tell like in his writing, he put way more thought, into what he was writing mm -hmm. on, on, you know, murder, music to be murdered by, you know. Yeah, it came out so quickly after Kamikaze. I mean, it, it, I don't even know if it was a year in between. Yeah, yeah, he dropped it fast. But he's, he's a writing, again, he's a, he's a student of the music. You know, he's, he's a student of, of hip-hop, you know, and he loves it. It's not something that he's doing because he's making money off of. He's doing it because he actually loves it. You know what I mean? It's his... Right. And, and and to me, you can't. I mean, what what other artists would you want to listen to? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It's somebody that actually loves their art form and what they're doing and takes it seriously. And you can see the longevity that you get out of being a student of that art form. Because look, he's in his. I think he's in his mid forties now, and he's still killing it. He's still as good as ever. And I feel like a lot of the younger guys now obviously not all of them but i feel like the majority of them they're probably not going to have as much longevity as someone like eminem or dr dre or these these figures who have really studied the art and are still because of the understanding of that art form and those roots they're still able to keep putting out more and more stuff and still you know remain relevant no oh, i agree 
I agree 120%. I think, again, you know, it's, it just seems like even the mind frame has changed where it's less people loving it instead doing it for the money instead of actually doing it for the love. You know, mm-hmm. there's less, it's really hard to sit down and, and have somebody um, find somebody to sit down and say, would, you know, would you do this without money being involved? You know, knowing you can't, knowing if you were going to make, you know, a dollar, would you still do this? You know, and most, yeah. most of the people I run into probably say they wouldn't, you know what I mean? So, yeah. especially in today's system, you know? Yeah. Um, so my next one, do you have a favorite Tupac album? Um, I do. Um, my, my favorite Tupac album, and a lot of people, I don't know, um, is Tupacalypse Now. It's probably one of my favorites. Uh, Again, Me Against the World, I think, or something like that, was another mm-hmm. double album he had. Um, which was, was, those are phenomenal albums. Machiavelli is another one, you know. Right. I mean, he, he, he was a great writer, you know what I mean? Isn't that Machiavelli one, like, called, like, the Illuminati story? Or did it say something about the Illuminati in it? Or am I thinking uh, of something else? Don Mock of, uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. It's I not on he, here. He the Voluminati or something like that. Yeah, Machiavelli. Yeah, it was just called Machiavelli, and that was the last album before he died. You know, oh, okay. which everyone was like freaking out because you know they were saying he's still alive. You know, and then <laughs> the album, you know, Machiavelli. He named the album Machiavelli, who he ended up faking his death. You know, fortunately. Well, what's the theory? Um. The theory is that he faked his death and he's in Cuba. That's the theory. Isn't that exactly. where like they all are? That's Elvis is in Cuba too, right? Yeah, I think I think a lot of people are in Cuba. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they said that he, you know, that they wanted to keep him alive, so he ended up faking his death and then going to Cuba. You know, and they hit him in Cuba. He's down there now. Interesting. Um, so to change gears just a little bit, I know you're very well versed in Latin music as well. I'm pretty ignorant, honestly, on a lot of Latin stuff beyond a couple of gigs I've played. You know, some people have turned me on to some tracks here and there. But are there three uh, Latin albums that you would recommend everybody check out just to get a good understanding uh, of Latin? It's very interesting. Um, what type of Latin? Depending on what you're looking for, I would say artists more than albums. You know, I would check oh, okay. out more artists. Um, for instance. If you're thinking of salsa music, right, um, always go to back to the old school to really understand it. Um, so I, I would say people have to, should be checking out uh, Ishmael Rivera, Eddie Palmieri, of course, you know, um, Hector Lavo, one of the most famous singers, you know, for, for salsa music. Um, you know, I would say start start there first, you know, develop a, I would say Ruben Blades is another one, you know, start with Ruben Blades music um, and really check out, check out the music behind it, you know, the way it's created and who produced it and that kind of stuff. Um, but I would start there first. I would say the artist first. Salsa is very big, it's very there's a lot of stuff, you know, so the albums, like classic albums, is tough to come by, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Hector's Gold is a phenomenal album. Hector Lavo. Um, but he's, he has so many different ones. So I would just check out the artist itself, you know, and just right. dive into the artist and the music behind it. How did, um, you, uh, how did you learn Latin piano? Did you take lessons for that or did you just listen a lot and play with people? I, you know what, that's, that's interesting. I, I started off, I always liked it. My pops always liked it, but we never really got into it. I didn't get into that stuff until about high school. Um, and it's real interesting because I, I got started, I was a drummer. Um, I used to play drums for, a while, for, for my junior high years. I played drums a lot. Um, where I was gigging. And during that time, I was going to the artist collective for drums, not just piano, but drums too. And when I got into the drums, uh, I ran into this teacher, uh, Ed Fast, who was a phenomenal drummer. And he actually showed me and my father the first, first Montuno I ever learned. Um, and it was really interesting because I was like, I was, I was so excited, you know, to check it out. 
and I wanted to know where else I could learn this stuff from. And I actually, my dad actually found a place. He was telling my dad about a place called Guaquia, who actually is in Hartford. And it's actually, again, it's like the Artist Collective, but it's the Spanish side of the Artist Collective where you start learning your roots, you know? And it teaches you about your roots and bomba and plana and different types of music within your roots. Um, and it goes into like all that kind of stuff. And, and we, we ended up taking lessons there for music. And uh, we started off, when I first started, it was just the classical danzas and danzones, classic like Latin music, you know? So a lot of the Montunos and stuff I had to learn on my own. And what I would do is I would listen to, just like I said, I would grab an artist, you know, then an album, I would just grab an artist and just go through and listen to every song and try to mimic what I was hearing, what I was hearing, you know? And I kept doing it over and over until I got to a point where the teacher was like, all right, we're gonna teach you some of this stuff, you know? And that's, that's kind of like where it got to. So that's awesome. Was the first Montuno that you learned, was it a major or minor? It was minor. It was the, the, the descending little, uh, major seven, flat seven, six thing. Yeah. Like that. Exactly. Exactly. It was very simple. You know, it was taught to me by a drummer. So (laughs) it was very simple. Montunos are awesome though. I remember when I was in high school and I heard my first Montuno, it really caught my ear. I mean, it's got a great sound to it. They're all just awesome. Let's tell you, it's, 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 that music, again, it's another, you know, one of those music that's phenomenal. You know, definitely people need to go check it out, you know, and, and you go talk to them about their music and they know, you know, all those new singers these days, you know, they know about their background of, of their music. They know about Hector Lavo, you know, they know about Ishmael Rivera, Ishmael Catania, you know, they know about all the guys, you know, um, they study the craft. You know what I mean? And that's, that's yeah. a, just, you know, just another art form that, you know, the artist in that art form respect the art form so much that they, you know, that they have that strong foundation to be able to go back and to go back and study. Yeah, that's awesome. I feel like there's not a, a, like a lot of Latin musicians in Connecticut too. I mean, there are some, but I feel like compared to other styles of music, like, you know, I used to play with Marco Torres once in a while and he told me that like, you and, you know, your brothers are some of the youngest guys in Connecticut <laughs> that are playing Latin music. Yeah, yeah, there isn't. There isn't as much as it used to be, you know, and it sucks to say this, but those programs are dying now. You know, there's no, there's no more Guaquia. There's no more Artist Collective anymore, you know. So those programs are completely dying, and it sucks because we're a staple in, in Hartford. You know, those, those programs is what kind of helped kept the music alive for the young kids, you know. Um, when did the Artist Collective stop? Uh, it stopped. I want to say it's, it's about six months now, you know, it's, it's, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, they've been having troubles, money pro- problems for a long time, but, um, yeah, it's been about six, six to eight months now. It's actually stopped. Well, that sucks. Yeah. I didn't know that. It's a bummer. All right. Well, I got two, two last questions for you. Non-music questions. I'm j- just for my own curiosity. Do you have a favorite movie? Do I, oh man, they live. My favorite all-time movie by John Carpenter. They live. Matter of fact, Never I might heard watch of that. that tonight. They, <laughs> they live. They live. It's it's um. I don't even think it's a movie. It's a documentary. Actually, it's basically. I mean, if if you know me, you know, and I'm on to you know what you do kind of know. I'm on to some alien stuff and creating and how everything's in the. I was background. wondering if we were going to get into that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's basically about that. You know, it, it's it's a movie. It, it's a documentary about how. That's basically what I feel is happening on Earth today is, is what that movie is all about. You know? What year is it from? Oh, it's it's got to be 70s or 80s. I mean, it's a beast. It's a B movie. Um, Roddy Roddy Piper is the main actor, you know? Oh, my God. Are you kidding yeah. me? <laughs> I'm a huge wrestling guy, so that's, that's a, a plus for me. Oh, man. <laughs> Let me see if I have, like, I have, like, a signed thing from him you know uh, from Roddy Piper yeah from from the movie because I'm a huge fan so did you meet Roddy Piper no I didn't I actually bought it online because I loved it I was like man I'm gonna buy this while it's cheap and and this is before he actually died you know so I was like let me buy it so once he died it actually went up the price before Roddy Piper died yeah yeah he only died a few years ago so that's right that's right yep so I've had this for I've had it before that and I was like I'm let me buy this I saw it 
I was like, let me buy it. So I bought it. And then he, unfortunately he passed, you know, I think he went a car accident or something like that. He ended up dying and the price went up obviously for the, you know, for the thing, but they live. Anyone definitely check out that movie. No, I'm going to check it out. John Carpenter. That's the guy that did Halloween, right? Yes. Which is another one of my favorite movies. (laughs) That's a classic. Yeah, yeah, because you know, I didn't know until recently he he made all the music for that movie because they didn't have enough money to hire people to do right. the soundtrack. It's cool. I mean, it's very it's, it makes sense when you listen to it too. It's very minimalist, like piano music. But the soundtrack on that is amazing. I love that piano it stuff. It is. I also love um, the thing, which is another classic movie that John Carpenter did. Um, to me, he he was way before his time. You know, still is today. But John Carpenter to me is way before his time, and uh, he's probably one of my favorite all-time favorites but um they live is one of my top movies nice you have any other favorite directors um i love quentin tarantino of course you know um what's your favorite tarantino movie ah that's a good question um that's a that's that's a that's a good question i want to say pulp fiction just because i can watch that over and over and over and never get bored Um, I also, I'm I'm a huge fan of Spike Lee, you know, and, you know, Bamboozled is one of my favorites and, uh, Mo Better Booze, you know, those two movies to me are top. Like I've only seen, uh, he did Malcolm X, right? He did do Malcolm X. That's That's all I've seen of his. I've always wanted to check out more of his movies because I've heard that he has like a lot of really artsy movies. He does. He's, I'm telling you, he's, he's, he's one of the most slept on artists, like movie filmmakers, you know, ever. What was he Denver. did a newer what's what's the newest one that he didn't he do something with like denzel washington uh, a newer one or am i i might be getting that wrong no you could be right I'm, I'm, i just probably don't know but yeah he probably did i mean I would, denzel him and denzel do so much stuff together you know so i'm sure mm-hmm. he did something but definitely check out more better blues which is about a jazz artist you know okay nice uh, and then all right my last question do you have a favorite book do I have a favorite book? Oh man, I would say my favorite book. I think I know what you're gonna say. <laughs> oh man, I I want to say okay, my favorite book, and I and I, I like before I read this book, I would probably have said, you know, um, Brave New World, 1984. Oh um, great, I love those. But I I want to say The Biggest Secret by David Icke. My favorite. Book. That's what I thought. <laughs> That's what I thought you were gonna say. Yeah. My favorite book, all time favorite, The Biggest Secret, David Icke. Um, yeah, changed a lot of things, the way I thought about a lot of things. <laughs> it's basically how, who's running this country and how it's being run. And um, this, the, the agenda it explains the Illuminati and what that's about, but how it goes deeper than the Illuminati and who's running the Illuminati. And it starts getting into uh, basically aliens are running the world. And he explains and he shows with pretty compelling evidence how um, this reptilian race is basically running from the, you know, have, have control over the Illuminati and how the Illuminati is able to control the world. Interesting. And that's what I mean when I say, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you're able to think for yourself and think outside of the box when it comes to certain things, because, you know, obviously a lot of people, you tell them that the book is about that and they're just going to think it's crazy and not even bother to read it. But to actually sit down and read stuff like that with an open mind, you know, it takes a special kind of person. And I, you know, I really appreciate that you're able to do stuff like that. And then you learn so much in the process, you know, and I'm sure a lot of times when you investigate a lot of stuff like that, a lot of it might be very misrepresented by the mainstream, you know, all the typical stuff that we see already. Oh, it usually is. And that's, that's one thing I'll tell you, like, it's funny to say this, but that's kind of, I, I bought the book to be quite honest with you, I bought that book to actually laugh at him and just be like, because of what I was told and what I heard about him, you know, I mean, take it or leave it. I mean, at the end of the day, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but he's just, it's, it's amazing that he's just presenting this evidence to you. Um, And the evidence that he's presenting is pretty compelling, you know, really hard to, to deny it, you know, um, what he's saying. Um, even going back to Smear, you know, um, and, and their, the way their, uh, the gods are and, and who they are and how you couldn't, you couldn't, you know, you can create them. So you had to, you, they never wanted you to, 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 
basically make sculptures of them or else they would kill you. So they had to do stuff that represented them. And it ends up most of the stuff looks like snakes. Um, I mean, even the Bible, you know, the whole idea of, you know, Adam and Eve getting manipulated by a serpent that talked, you know, and its punishment was to take its legs out. So it had to scurry the earth, you know. So obviously, you know, and then there's other books that kind of, you know, um, parallel with that, that, you know, in, in the Jewish texts that talk about a snake, you know, a serpent, they don't even say snake, it's serpent that basically has arms and legs, you know, and talks. So that right there sounds like a reptilian to me, you know, and it just goes on and on. And these books have been written, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. So, I mean, he's coming up, he's not coming up making this stuff up. He's, he's just taking this evidence that he has from all these different areas and cultures and just seeing the, the similarities. And if there's smoke, there's fire, you know what I mean? That's kind of mm. the vibe. You know, I really think, think for yourself, you know, put the evidence out there, um, use something that's not used a lot today, which is called common sense and figure out what's, what's right, you know, and what's, what makes more sense is what probably what it is, you know? Absolutely. And I think that's why we hit it off so well when we first met, because we just started talking and we were just on the same page with so much of this stuff. And, you know, I really uh, appreciate it. You know, I appreciate your open-mindedness and I, I love our conversations and, I really appreciate you coming on and doing this. This was really enjoyable. I think very informative for people looking to get a little inside peek of the rap industry. And uh, yeah, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me, man. Anytime again, you know, this can go on forever. You know how we do. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We need to set aside some more time. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> and then just real quick, if anybody wants to find you on social media and stuff for your uh, production stuff, where can they find you? Yeah. Right now I'm, I'm finishing up a website. Um, it's, it's you could look under alien religion productions.com or uh king solomon productions.com um it, it's getting put up right now it's getting fixed up um so you can definitely find me there you can find me under uh king, uh, king solomon on um on uh, bandcamp and instagram it's king solomon 3000 and on uh you got pictures of your tarantula on there too. Just a heads up if that's you're afraid right. of spiders. I, I put those up just for you, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's how I found. I hate that. I'm scrolling through Instagram and all of a sudden I see a tarantula and I like jump. Like, Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, man. And then we have, and then on Facebook, it's King Damian Curtis Solomon, you know? So great. Well, if you need there. to find them, that's where it is. So, all right. Thanks again for doing this. I really appreciate it. Anytime, man. Thank you again for everything. Absolutely. Take care. Take it easy.